The Wheat School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Alberta Grains, CNM Seeds, and Syngenta Canada. Find more episodes of The Wheat School by going to wheatschool.com. Peter Johnson at Wheat Pete, realagriculture.com. And I'm here today with Joanna Fallings, the cereal specialist with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Agribusiness, OMAFA. And we are here yet again to talk about the YEN program, the Great Lakes Yield Enhancement Network. It's 2024. We've got new results. Joanna, let's start with the YEN program. How big has it gotten? Because it's incredible how growers want to grow better wheat. Yeah, it's amazing. So in 2021, we started with 43 farms, and now in 2024, we're up to 184 farms across a number of states. The first year, we started with Michigan and Ontario, and now we've got Michigan, Ontario, Ohio, New York, all the way to Washington, North Carolina, <laughs> Kentucky, you name it. Everyone's getting involved. Yeah. Okay, so I, I just got to say, I don't think Washington and North Carolina are Great Lakes states. But nonetheless, it's so cool that growers want to grow better wheat. So 2024 results, where are we at? What? Who's, who's the big winner? So really excited. This year's winner is Nick Suen from Michigan. Nick had a yield of 171.99 bushels per acre. And another fan favorite up in the top three is Jeff Crone. He had 170 bushels per acre. And last but not least, in third place, our, we had an Ontario grower at 160 bushels, and that was John Kilburn. Yeah, and so by the way, at 171.9, <laughs> it's 172. Let's be real, okay? It's 172 yes. <laughs> bushel. And, and what... You know, all the Ontario people listening, number one and number two are both Michigan growers. Come on, Ontario, let's get with the program here. So, Joanna, really cool. As we go through the whole yen program, there's some things I think that have been consistent every year. If I'm a wheat grower, what are the three or four things that I have to do or have to look at to know if I'm going to be a top wheat grower? For sure. I think there's three main things that seem to come out year over year. One of those being biomass. The yeah. more biomass we have, the more photosynthetic uh, area we have there to capture that solar radiation. Year over year, we see biomass really pays when it comes to yield. Yeah, this, and, and, but that biomass probably isn't a, a rocket science thing, no. right? Because grain is just a proportion of the total weight of the plant. So if I don't have big total weight, pretty hard to get big grain yields, Absolutely. right? So at, yeah, biomass, that's one, yeah. not rocket science, but, but remember, what else? The other one is head counts. We seem to get really high yields when we're at the 800 to 1,000 heads per meter square, and these growers that are in the top three every year all get 900 plus heads per meter square year over year. And that comes out in all of the data. We just heads per meter square, the more heads we have, the more yield. And that's really interesting because a lot of the high yield wheat growers worldwide are lower head counts than what we are here in the Great Lakes or in North America, which speaks a little bit maybe to the different climate, uh, uh, perhaps different uh, varieties, different genetics in terms of, of how that genetics respond. And there's one other thing though, right, Joanna? Yeah, and another thing that plays into this is thousand grain weight. And so we're seeing that those growers who are able to keep that crop canopy nice and green and photosynthesizing later in through that grain fill period, we're able to bring that thousand grain weight up. And I think that's also what some of these growers are doing in these other parts of the world where they do have lower heads per meter square is that that thousand grain weight is able to compensate for some of that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So our 1,000 grain weight is often 35 grams per 1,000 kernels. The, the yield winners are often at 50 grams per 1,000 kernels. Nonetheless, 1,000 grain weight is about a 5% difference between the, the top 20% and the bottom 20%. 5% is still worth chasing. So, okay, if those are the three things that are kind of always coming to the forefront, from a management standpoint, what does Wheat Pete do when he goes to his wheat field to get there? Well, the first thing we gotta do is focus on our planting date. If you wanna grow big wheat, you need to be planting that wheat crop on time. Uh, the high yielding growers in 2024 had an, or in 2023 had an average of six days earlier than those that were the lower yielding. And actually in 2022, that window was even bigger at 11 days. And as we know in the fall, when things 
start to cool off, those six days can make the biggest difference when it comes to your final yield. Yeah, incredible. This year, 2024 Ontario, you can tell mm -hmm. the fields that were planted on September the 29th versus September the 30th versus October the 1st. Even today, it's October the 24th today, we can see the difference because every one of those days was 20 growing degree days and every 100 growing degree days is another growth stage. So that was like a fifth of a growing or a stage ahead and it's massive, yeah. right? You don't think one day matters, particularly one day early, but one day early matters more than anything else. Now, let's move in. So those are kind of the key things and there's other things that we've talked about before. But what else have we learned from the Yen program? What are the nuances that have sort of jumped out as we look at, at the high yield growers? Are, is there anything else that we can tell the growers that they should look at? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that really stands out with some of the high yielding growers and Jeff Crone being one of them is a narrow row spacing. Those on five inch rows versus seven and a half inch rows seem to be able to get those higher yields with that narrow row spacing and at lower seeding rates too. Yeah, and so that's, I mean, both Jeff and Nick Suen, and right? Nick, are, yep. They're both five inch growers and, and they're both been consistently in the top three over years. Yes. And that kind of pushes you to say, well, maybe there's something to narrower row widths, but it's also interesting that they're often at lower seeding rates. Mm -hmm. So some really cool work by Manny Singh out of Michigan State University, where they're precision planting five inch rows, and they're seeing some pretty significant yield increases. One of the things that kind of jumps out of that research is this German work that looks at if the, if the seeds are closer than half an inch together, one centimeter together, you get some plant to plant competition, yes. right? And so you, you kind of look at that and say, wow, what about broadcast then? Does that work? So surprisingly, in some scenarios, broadcasting does work as well. And maybe the idea there is that we don't get that same competition in the seed to seed. But we know there are challenges with broadcast, so it's not necessarily a road we want to go down. But there is something to this you know, idea of having those seeds dispersed more evenly and being able to fully express themselves, so to speak. Yeah, and that, that is kind of cool because, you know, wheat peat <laughs> thinks that wheat is a real crop. And growers get all a gaga about corn and corn planting date and or depth rather and corn emergence and now we're going to tell growers oh with wheat that doesn't matter you broadcast it you disc it in it doesn't matter that some seeds are on the soil surface and some seeds are four inches deep but pete thinks it does dang it because <laughs> when we plant with a precision planter with a corn planter unit we still get higher yields that that depth does matter you lose on the depth with broadcast but you probably gain it back with seed to seed spacing so we don't get the bunches. You know, controlled spill devices are drills, they bunch them like crazy. So before we finish up, I wanna just talk about what have the researchers learned out of the Yen program? We've learned so much, but one of the things that has really stood out this year is how we look at and how we calculate yield potential. So we look at temperature, we look at solar radiation, we look at soil available water, and one of the things that we assume in that is our rooting depth. And one of the things that we're finding with these high yielding growers is we have some of these growers exceeding what we expect their yield potential to be. So we had one grower this year, Jeff Crone, he was actually 155% of his yield potential. And so it's whoa, whoa, whoa. 155. <laughs> okay, 155 percent of your yield potential clearly shows us the algorithm needs some work, right? Exactly. And so the thinking there is one, maybe we're underestimating or overestimating our rooting depth. But the other piece is maybe that some of these fields that continue to come on top year over year have access to water below the, so the soil surface that we're not accounting for. Perhaps there's a, a elevated water table, or perhaps there's some sort of moisture below that the the roots are able to access and it almost acts like subsurface irrigation and we're not accounting for that as much in the model as maybe we should be. Yeah, so really cool. So we've, we've learned a bunch of things out of the end. I mean, planning date is everything because it drives those key factors. Green, the stay green is important because it drives thousand grain weight. Roll width is something I think a lot of us can look at. Also seed to seed placement. I think that's really cool. But the last thing that I think is really interesting is that Solar radiation is pretty much the same, doesn't seem to be a big factor, but water and water availability, and maybe that's why some fields are always the highest yielding, right? Definitely. Yeah, very cool. Peter Johnson, Joanna Fallings, 
realagriculture.com. Whatever you do, grow, grow great wheat. Great wheat.